So we're comfortable at this point with what a group is. What's the definition of a group? Associativity, closure, identity, inverses. We also saw the definition of a subgroup. A subgroup is what we find when a smaller, potentially, subset of elements inside of a group itself also forms a group under the operation that it inherits from its parent group. So we have this notion of groups and subgroups, and those notions are very abstract. They admit a lot of different kinds of examples. Um, and as we've already seen, a lot of the examples that we've studied don't seem to have a lot to do with one another. So what we'd like to know is what, if anything, uh, are the common threads that we can find between very disparate groups. So if we want to begin the process, that is really what we're doing this semester, which is to classify what kinds of groups are there out there in the world, specifically what kinds of finite groups exist out in the world. Um, then the first question that we might ask is, well, where do finite groups come from, in a sense? Uh, how do we build a finite group? Or maybe better, how can we locate a finite group in the wild somehow, right? If, if I'm living within some larger, scarier group, can I identify a piece of that larger group, which is a finite group? If we can then understand the properties of that finite piece, uh, then hopefully that'll tell us something about the bigger group as well. So the particular variety, the flavor of finite groups that are the most elementary, the, the easiest to construct, the easiest to understand, are the groups that are called the cyclic groups. So this next series of videos, we're going to dig into what makes cyclic groups so simple on the one hand, but profound and important on the other hand. And the goals are twofold. First of all, for a group that's cyclic, we want to understand what is the relationship between the order of a cyclic group and the order of the elements within that cyclic group. In the case where the order of the group is finite, we can ask a question like, oh, all right, let's say G is a cyclic group of order 20, so it has 20 elements. Is one of those elements an element of order 5? Is one of them an element of order 6? Does it have an element of order 10? Does it have an element of order 15? So what are the relationships there uh, between the order of the, the whole group itself and the order of the elements within that group? That's goal number one. And it turns out there's quite a bit to say there. And then secondly, if we can say something about the orders of elements in a cyclic group, then we should also be able to say something about the subgroups that reside within a cyclic group. What kind of subgroups do cyclic groups have, and what's a way of trying to account for them all? And so we'll see in the last of the videos in this series uh, how to construct a subgroup lattice for a group that can show us what are all the possibilities, what are all the subgroups uh, that reside within a parent cyclic group. So what I want you to keep in mind as we're going through the, these couple of videos is that we're going to be treating cyclic groups often in a very abstract form, right? That what characterizes a cyclic group is the existence of a generator whose powers give us all of the elements in the group. And that's a very abstract, very broad notion. Um, but I want you to know that in my own mind's eye, when I think about cyclic groups and what do they look like and how do they behave, I only have two models in, in my little cartoon bubble above my head when I think about cyclic groups. And so I want to let you in on those couple of models. So let's suppose we start with a cyclic group. Group's got to have an identity, so let's write down the identity element E. Well, and a cyclic group is also characterized by having this generator, this element A, whose powers generate the whole rest of the group. So if I call A my generator, then if I know nothing else about A, then I know that the powers of A, which I've sort of sketched along here, A, the second power of A, third, fourth, and fifth, but then also the inverse of A, and the second power of the inverse of A, which is called A to the minus 2, and so forth. We know this inverse exists because of the inverse's property that every group enjoys. If I visualize all of those powers of A, then if I know nothing else about A, it kind of looks like we have a familiar sort of picture emerging for what I'm thinking of my group looking like. And indeed, if A is an element that has infinite order, so in other words, if none of these powers of A are equal once again to the identity element, if the only power of A that equals the identity element is the zeroth power of A, then this is the picture that I want in my mind's eye for what this cyclic group looks like, cyclic group generated by A. And it looks an awful lot like a number line. So the picture that I have in my mind about what an infinite cyclic group looks like is just a picture of the integers, where the operation on the integers is the operation of addition. Why? Because it looks like the number line that we all learned when we were you know, nine years old. I'm just picking a, a, a number out of a hat here. Um, but what's the more specific nature of that relationship? In what way is this infinite cyclic group the same as the integers under addition? Well, the only clue that I'm going to give you 
is where do I find the integers in my picture? I find them exactly as the exponents that are on my a's. So if I want to know where to find z in this picture, z is right here, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, the identity, which is the zeroth power, a itself, which is the first power, and then the second, third, fourth, fifth, and so forth. So that's where I find the elements of the integers in my picture. We can also check that the operation of addition on these exponents is exactly what happens when I multiply two elements of this group. In other words, use the group operation. And so there really is a picture of sameness between this infinite cyclic group and the additive group of integers. And that's the picture in my mind when my cyclic group is a group of infinite order because its generator has infinite order. On the other hand, the somehow more interesting cases are what happens when my generator has finite order. So if A has finite order, that means that there's some finite power of it such that the, that power of A becomes the identity. Just for the sake of argument, let's suppose that's the fourth power. So what would happen if in this example the order of A was equal to 4? Then it would mean that this fourth power is again the identity element. And if the fourth power is the identity element, that also means that the negative fourth power, that's the fourth power of the inverse, is the identity element, and so forth and so forth. So suddenly, I have a lot of things on my number line which are all equal to the identity element. Or in other words, a lot of integers on my number line that are somehow now equal to zero. So a to the minus 8, a to the minus 4, a to the 0, a to the 4. a raised to any multiple of 4 power is now going to be the identity again. But for the same reason, if I multiply this whole infinite string of equations, if I multiply it by a, then I find out the first power of a is going to be equal to the fifth power of a. So this element is going to have to agree with that element. And likewise, it'll have to agree with that element back here, and so forth and so forth. And likewise for the second power and the sixth power, the third power and the seventh power, and so on and so on. So as soon as my generator has finite order, now suddenly I'm getting whole classes of my elements, my integers on my number line, they're all the same as one another. Now how are those classes behaving? Well, I kind of like to think of them as being arranged around the face of a clock. So my picture in my head of a finite cyclic group is a picture of a clock face. And on that clock face, we have exactly as many elements as the order of my generator. Here the generator was order 4. I ended up with only four different elements inside of my group. So what's our model for a group that does that? Well, again, when we were looking for the integers in our original model, we looked at the exponents. What happens if we look at the exponents now that I have only four elements in my group? Well, the exponents exist, again, in these families. All the multiples of four exponents are all the same as one another. All the things which are one more than a multiple of four are the same as one another. One, five, negative three, negative seven, and so forth and so forth. And so when I look at those, what I discover is that these are exactly the equivalence classes of integers modulo four. So where an infinite cyclic group will sketch us a picture of the integers under addition, a finite cyclic group of order n will sketch us a picture of equivalence classes of integers modulo n, where the operation is again addition, but not addition of integers, rather addition of equivalence classes. So what that tells me is that every finite cyclic group is going to be the same as the group of integers modulo n, where n is the order of the generator. So all of that is to say that any time I think about cyclic groups, these are the two pictures that I have in my mind's eye. If it's an infinite cyclic group, it looks to me like the integers. If it's a finite cyclic group, it looks to me like the integers modulo n where n is the order of the generator. So keep these pictures in mind as we go forward and explore these goals. What are some relationships between the order of the group and the order of elements? And then what can we say about the existence and the nature of subgroups inside of a cyclic group?